The first shell smashed into the operating theatre at Izum Central Hospital on the night of March the 3rd. As Russian forces advanced, staff evacuated the patients to other parts of Ukraine. But after Russia took the town a month later, they had to deal with a new kind of patient, victims of beating and torture. The Russians accused 67-year-old Mikhailo of helping Ukrainian saboteurs blow up a school, which he denies. He wasn't the only one. The doctors knew better than to ask too much. Like most buildings in Izum, the hospital had no water or power, but it was at least a refuge for those who lived in terror of what was happening elsewhere. For the five months of Russian occupation, this police station was the most feared building in Izum. The Russians knew that some local people would be feeding intelligence to the Ukrainian armed forces. So they brought suspects here to extract information from them through torture. Inside, dozens of passports the Russians confiscated to prevent the residents of Izum from escaping. A Ukrainian policeman took us to see the cells. Down to a darker, danker basement where more prisoners were held, mainly men but also a few women, sometimes for weeks on end, in appalling, insanitary conditions. The broken buildings of Izum a home to those who've been left with broken bodies and broken minds. Я пять дней там был. Все пять дней меня били. Каской по голове лупили какой-то битой по пяткам. Не знаю чем. Ну, ребра были, два ребра поломанных. Было. Плясали на мне там. Был. He fell on the hard concrete floor. They wanted information about weapons and troop movements, but he had none. Alexander is haunted by what he endured in the police station. After release and hospital treatment, he was captured again and only freed by Ukrainian soldiers when they retook his Yum. Я плакал. <laughs> я плакал, потому что я уже сам с собой попрощался. Я думал, все. Around is you, reminders of a time before the war, but the Russians were never going to give peace a chance. Signs of a lost life when a daughter or a son played the piano. It's not the houses, but the spaces between the houses. The worst single loss of life came on March the 9th, when Russian artillery destroyed the center of an apartment block, killing 54 people who were trapped in the basement. Serhi Stanko is retrieving his mother's few remaining possessions. He says regular Russian soldiers who occupied Izum were not as bad as those from the separatist Luhansk People's Republic, the LNR. Uh, regular army, so-so, but people from LNR, yeah, DNR, they are... They're crazy. Crazy. When they took some alcohol, they could shoot each other. Shoot in the air. <laughs> They're crazy people. Took everything they want. <laughs> Cars, goods, everything. In the end, the Russians fled, leaving behind their most important equipment, tanks marked with their trademark Z. Now old people are desperate for humanitarian aid. 
During the occupation, there was no gas for cooking, very little food, and no communication with the outside world. The Russians told them nearly all of Ukraine was in Russian hands, so some people cooperated, believing the Ukrainian authorities would never be back. Now neighbor accuses neighbor of collaboration, of threats and violence. So did many people collaborate? We drove to Angelica's house to meet her husband. He claims the neighbors told Russian soldiers that a guy he knew had a gun. Ukrainian forces are clearing up the debris of war and feeling victorious. The flag is the symbol of their recent success and hope of regaining all territory still under Russian control. But war and occupation have left Izum broken, buildings destroyed, people injured, society divided. In a forest on the outskirts of town, police and prosecutors oversee the exhumation of a makeshift cemetery. Every day the graves give up more bodies, more evidence for potential war crimes trials. But justice, if it ever comes, will not wipe away hatred and distrust, nor assuage the pain which cannot forget. Fighting is going on, quite fierce fighting, to the east of where I am. And although the Ukrainian onslaught, which was a lightning assault, which took so many towns, including Izum, in the last few weeks, has slowed, they're still taking territory bit by bit. And I think that that is why President Putin realizes that he's in a very difficult situation. Because at the moment, he is on the back foot, both militarily and internally politically. It's very difficult to answer some of the questions which are now being raised within Russia. And also diplomatically, internationally. Because some of his allies are beginning to ask, are we backing a loser? And I think that the problem is for President Putin and for the rest of the world that some countries think that this may make him more dangerous than ever. And the next few weeks are very unpredictable. Lindsay, thanks very much. Well, Vladimir Putin is expected to speak any minute and we'll bring you that as soon as we have it. But our foreign affairs correspondent, Porik O'Brien, has been looking at the build-up to his speech in Russia and the occupied territories where referendums are due to be held. Over the last 24 hours, a number of developments started pointing to this evening's announcement. First up, the Russian Duma passed harsh new penalties for deserters and draft dodgers. The first clue that an announcement on mobilization may be imminent. All the while, a raft of referenda announcements were made in the areas or oblasts under varying levels of Russian control in the south and east of Ukraine. Take Kherson in the south, for example. Here, members of the Civic Council vote for an appeal to the Russian installed head of the region to hold a referendum on joining Russia. Remember, this is a place where protests against a proposed referendum took place in April. And a referendum was recently postponed here after Ukraine's counter-offensive in the region. So let's look in more detail at what's happening with this sudden flurry of announcements in the temporarily occupied territories. The occupied regions of Donetsk and Luhansk will hold referendums to join the Russian Federation starting as early as Friday. The part of Zaporizhia region currently under Russian control says it could also hold a referendum in the coming days. And the Russian-sponsored administration in Kherson has asked the Kremlin for permission to hold a vote on joining Russia as soon as possible. Luhansk has been almost completely annexed, but about half of Donetsk and about a third of Zaporizhia are still under Ukrainian control, with the majority of the Kherson district still held by Russia. 
So, how will voting be organized so quickly in territories which Russia does not completely control? And how can you hold meaningful referendums in places which are in the throes of an active war? The answer is, you can't. These are sham referenda from an established Russian playbook. The same thing happened in Crimea in 2014. Referenda held, the results of which were not recognized by the international community. The point is to project fake legitimacy and justify further military action, which ultimately ended up with the war in Ukraine today. This is the reaction from President Macron today. She a declaré la guerre. Russia declared war. It invaded this region. It bombed, it killed people and forced people to flee. And now it's saying it's going to have a referendum. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be funny. It's cynical. And of course, the international community will not recognize it. We don't know what Putin will announce later this evening and don't know what it will mean for the war in Ukraine. If he announces a mass mobilization, it will present a worrying escalation, although it could take a long time to translate into boots on the ground. Or he could simply endorse the various referenda announced. Either way, what's happening now is a direct result of the recent Ukrainian counteroffensive. Well, I'm joined from Moscow by Nina Krusheva, Professor of International Affairs at the New, York, New School in New York. She's also the great-granddaughter of former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Nina Krusheva, this business of referendums, illegal referendums, annexing swathes of Ukraine, is it, in your view, a major escalation by Putin? Yes, yes, it is. And it's quite a disarray here in Moscow because everybody's trying to figure out what exactly it might mean. Also, I think you've been reporting on that. There is a parliament now mobilization laws that came through swiftly, immediately. Um, uh, laws against whatever disobedience they may be. So it is entirely possible that he's escalating because as we've been arguing for five months already, I mean, now with Ukraine offensive, it's even more so that Putin really has no place to go except for the winning. And if he's not winning, then he's going to be pushing forward and making the war larger and larger and larger. So if the referenda happen and all these parts, which is assumed and probably will be uh will become part of russia they will have to be admitted they would have to be it would have to be agreed upon and therefore now ukrainians will be fighting uh in the kremlin view will be fighting with uh russia proper and therefore they will be in entirely different rules of war also in regard to the western supply of arms because they then will be almost officially fighting with russia i don't know what it means i'm not a military analyst i have no prediction to that but that's a major escalation and our argument is that putin has no place but to escalate with right. what's happening right and you mentioned there in Moscow that there's people are feeling in some disarray. Are people packing their bags, fearing that they might be conscripted? Well, that too, but also it sort of there's a ma major change because we've been told, or they've been told for six months, there is no mobilization, it's a spe special military operation. And I think one of your correspondents said that Putin doesn't want to say war. Well, I actually... I actually think that um, uh, even if there is, um, they may not wanted war before, but it does look like they're going to announce war because, as I said, the West and Ukraine, if the referendum happen, they will be then fighting in Russian view with the Russian Federation. So people will be forced to uh, be uh, war conscripts and the country and people in the country will be forced to deal with the uh, with a martial law military situ situation and, and be forced to become patriots even if they're not. Mm. I, mean, and even if they're not I, I asked you on this programme on May the 2nd if you feared that this would end up in a nuclear confrontation and you paused for a very long time before saying that you hoped it wouldn't. What is your answer to that tonight? I still hope it wouldn't. I, I, I still do. Uh, because it does seem that for now it's a military escalation in regular military terms. But as we've discussed, and you know, we've been discussing that for months, and in May too, uh, we talked about this. If so, Putin has been escalating 
this story is escalating. Ukraine is not giving up. Ukraine, in fact, is on the offensive. They've been excellent reporting from uh, the Guardian. Um, um, I forgot his on, first on name. The, uh, yeah. Yes, he's reporting on that. And the reporting is that the Russians are asking, what if Ukraine is going to start invading Russia? I mean, that even two weeks ago, a month ago, it was an inconceivable question. So what happens is that Putin has to, by hook or by crook, to show that, in fact, Russia is at war and everybody has to comply with that particular reality. Nina Kosheva, thank you very much for joining us.